Excellent. Thank you for coming, everyone. Welcome. Good, uh, good lunchtime. Good afternoon, I guess. Um, so this is uh, Perfecting Our Puzzles, Lessons in Level Design from Bears vs. Art. Uh, my name is Leighton Hawks. I'm a games designer there at Halfbrick. Uh, just to give you some idea, like a teeny bit about me and where I've come from. Uh, so if, if you were to go way back, you would probably see something like this between eight and 12 in every book that I ever had. Uh, I, I started really early, I guess, designing levels, quote unquote, uh, with drawing mazes. And I drew, I drew them so much that I even got, they even got dubbed by my classmates as brain mazes. Uh, they, got, they had a fond name. Because I was, I was akin to pulling people over and, and getting them to play through these kind of levels with their fingers. Uh, I even drew like little platform levels with guys and buildings. And yeah, I, I got into this stuff really young. Uh, and, and as I kind of got towards the end of school, uh, that kind of changed as I discovered video games. I mean, they'd kind of been a part of my life all along, but I, I went into building them kind of late in high school. And where I got started was I picked up some level editors. Uh, there's a couple of Unreal Tournament 3 levels to the side there. There's a Skyrim level at the top. There's some kind of later ones, but I'd been building levels kind of all through school. And my mazes changed from uh, the really kind of haphazard brain mazes that were still super cool. Uh, to this kind of stuff that you can see in, in the bottom right there that's a, you know, had unit scales and there was a critical path and it kind of showed you what enemies were gonna be in a level and things like that. So um, this is kind of my first taste of games development and I guess how I got my hands dirty. Uh, so from that, I got into a course here uh, in Melbourne at Victoria University. Uh, it was a advanced diploma of multimedia in brackets, games development uh, and what was really good about the course is it was very specific to games development. I did, but it was very broad. So I did programming, I did art, I did probably what they thought was design. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it gave me a really good foundation, I guess, in, in the skills that, that everyone would have when they were making a game. So it, it was really useful to me to have those skills, even though I'm a designer now uh, and I don't do programming, like having that knowledge is totally invaluable. Uh, and that was the building I, I studied in Melbourne. It was pretty nice in the middle of the city. So during that course, I, I ended up making, or they, well, they gave us the opportunity to make a, a final year project. And this took six months of our time. And uh, this is what I made. It's a game called Gemma in the Living World. Uh, it's a kind of fable told by a little girl that goes to, a little girl called Gemma that goes to a, a kind of different world. And it's a puzzle platform game, has like narrative elements in there. Again, I'm, I'm going back to level design here without, without knowing it. And so I decided after this, this game did all right. I think you can still get it on Indie City. I ended up releasing it ages ago. Um, it, it, it did quite well. It won a couple of uh, Teachers of Media Awards and things like that. And so I decided I wanted to do something completely different. So I went and did an exchange program so, uh, at the other side of the world. And I ended up here uh, in Denmark. So in Denmark, I studied in Copenhagen for six months. Uh, I encourage you to go to Denmark. Denmark's pretty cool. Uh, and I studied a Bachelor of Mediology, which is like media technology merged into one word. And there I did research on visual cues. And uh, we did a thesis project there on how visual cues impact in player decision making when they're going through a level. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about this later on in the talk uh, in more detail. But uh, suffice to say, I did that while I was in Denmark. And we made a, a game as part of that research project. So I guess this brings me to like, I've been designing levels a long time, I guess, uh, in, in some form or another, even though maybe it wasn't formalized. And all of that work that I just showed you is, is what I showed Halfbrick to get a job there. And so I joined Halfbrick ooh, about three years ago now. And I've been, I've, I had the privilege of working on live ops for Fruit Ninja and Jetpack Joyride very briefly. And I've been on the full development team for Fish Out of Water and most recently Bears vs. Art. And today, obviously, I'm going to be giving examples from Bears vs. Art and, and kind of how we design levels in that game and hopefully how it can help you design levels. So live ops is basically updates. Um, so we call it live operations when we're running. Uh, running a game that's already out there, essentially, and, and updating that. So that's what LiveOps is. 
So just to give you a bit of overview on the game if you haven't played it, uh, it's free on iOS Android, so you should check it out if you haven't. Uh, essentially, it's a free-to-play puzzle game. Uh, the, the goal is to destroy all the art in every level, and you play as Rory the Bear, because of course bears don't like art. And we introduce move limits and time limits that you have to abide by, hence the puzzle, and some obstacles into the levels. And we have this kind of world map between each level that you can see there. Uh, that's kind of, you know, the adventure that he goes on. And obviously this was a team effort, uh, so thanks to my talented team back at Halfbrick. They're awesome. And I guess to give you some more information on our levels, they focused on planning moves where there is a move limit that uh, players have to, to use and they're required to think ahead in this way to plan out how to reach every painting in that number of moves. As part of this process, players are also constantly judging angles and kind of figuring out where the bear's gonna land when they make their move. And we introduce different entities and, and mechanics into that that kind of have multiple states, so it gets a little bit harder to judge what will happen and where you'll end up, thus increasing the difficulty. And, and lastly, yeah, we had to avoid hazards in those obstacles and, and there are hazards in the game that will fail you. And we created hundreds of these puzzles. We, we did a lot, a lot of uh, puzzles for this game. So this talk is 15 level design lessons that we've learned from making this puzzle game. From the small ones to the big ones and probably everything in between. Uh, and I'd be really happy if you get three of them that you can use on your own project, but hope, I hopefully you get more. Uh, but hopefully you get three too you can actually really use. So let's get into it. Lesson one. Continue to use your prototype. So the prototype of a game is, is usually used to prove the idea. And when in full development or when full development begins, it's often archived and you only look at that for either reference on how to make your full game or maybe for a bit of nostalgia to see, haha, that's where this game started, that's amazing. Uh, but with Bears vs. Art, we continued to experiment with our prototype well after production had begun on the full game. While the core team worked on pre-production, uh, the designers on the project made levels in the prototype, which you can see here, uh, and we added new mechanics to the prototype. Uh, we were kind of like acting as if this was our full game until we had a full game to play with. And this allowed us to get our level, level design hands dirty much faster. Uh, and much earlier in the development process than we would have otherwise. We've all heard that you learn by doing, and this kind of rang true for us, we got to doing much faster uh, than if we hadn't extended and expanded on that prototype. It allows us, allowed us to find the spicy with our game concept much faster, the mechanics that were the most compelling or the level shapes that kind of fit our game best. And to give you just some idea of what spicy means, uh, this is portals in our final game. Uh, you roll into them and you roll out the other side in the same direction you rolled in. It's, it's a portal. Uh, this actually started as a trapdoor in our prototype. Uh, and we prototyped this out. And this was after we'd started production on the full game. But uh, we, we liked them so much that we ended up developing in the, in the full game because we'd proved them in the prototype already. Uh, and this worked for levels too. So this is a level in the prototype that is pretty much exactly the same in the full game. Probably helps if I do this. Uh, of course, our prototype was landscape and our full game is portrait on phones, so we kind of rotated a lot of our levels. Why did so, you do that? Sorry, it was really complete. Sorry, yeah? Landscape versus portrait, I mean, anyone, anyone could have done this. What was your design decision to make it portrait? Our, our design decision to make the game portrait? Um, yeah, it, it basically we wanted it to be playable with one, one finger. Um, and uh, you tend to, when you're holding a phone in landscape, have to use both hands. So you want it to be kind of uh, a one hand, I should say, game. Um, so that's kind of our, our direction with that, yeah. So, so yeah, just, just going back, I mean, experimenting. Whoops, I'm going, going forward. That's fine. Lesson two, <laughs> play test early and often. Uh, so this is obviously, you hear this a lot, like you, you need to play test, but we, we really got to this really early. We didn't wait until we had like a finished shiny product to show someone and go, oh, we need to like see if this works now. Uh, we had this and before the full game was even up and running, we were learning things about how people interacted with our puzzle designs because we were play testing the prototype. 
It's about say, seeing how people solve problems differently and solve the challenges in your levels differently. And, and really, we saw that it, it, it varies widely. We saw that adults would plan out all of their moves before making uh, that first actual movement in the level. They waited until they, they, they solved out the whole puzzle, basically. Whereas kids would just dive in and, and see what worked, a really experimental approach. And seeing how po people solve your puzzles um, will give you many, many ideas. So the earlier you can do this, the more ideas you're going to get. You're going to, uh, you have a question? How frequently? Ooh, so during the prototype period, we, we at least had like two play tests a week. Uh, so we would, we would play test er earlier in the week, get some results from that, make changes to the game, make changes to the prototype, make changes to the levels, uh, and test it again later in the week. And then we tried to get a wide variety of people to play test it. So we did, we did have kids, we had um, people that were older, younger, different genders. Um, we tried to get as many people as possible because this, we, we wanted to see wh where this game resonated, which kind of people, uh, uh, you know, really liked this kind of puzzle game. Uh, so yeah. How, would you, how did you get a tester to play? Oh, how did we get testers? So we literally just put a call out on our website and say, uh, half bricks needing testers. Uh, so th there's probably a slight bias there with the kinds of people we get, but um, we tried to be, uh, uh, we, we tried to pick the people that were going to uh, kind of give us the best uh, unbiased version of, of kind of what a, a general user of our games look like. So what mechanisms did you use to distribute all the testers that you had? So we, how do we get the game to? How do we distribute it? So this was all done internally. Um, we got the playtesters into Halfbrick. Yeah, um, we find it really invaluable during playtesting to watch someone play our game. Uh, that that just gives you that gives you way more than asking them questions at the end. You can you can be terrible at asking questions at the end of a playtest and still get like eighty percent of the value out of a playtest. So basically this comes down to like you're going to have to know how people solve the problems you give them in order to design good problems for them to solve. So lesson three, design your own level editor. So we knew we needed a good way to make lots of levels. And we had this guy at our company who's the games programmer on my team. His name's Adam Wood. Uh, He's really good at driving cars. He's also really good at making level editors. He's done it before, and he did it with Bears vs. Art. And we got together with him, the two designers on the project, and we made sure that we were making a level editor that the designers, uh, the level editor in a way that designers wanted to use it. Right? We wanted to make it as simple as possible. And remember, we'd built levels for the prototype, and we'd play tested them really early. Like we'd done a lot of exploration on this prototype, even during full development or alongside full development. So we knew really what we wanted with a level editor. We knew exactly what we wanted. So we got that st process started with with this guy. And then we set a goal that the CEO should be able to, to make, a, make and play a level in five minutes in our et level editor, which is saying nothing on his intelligence, he just has no time. And this design goal meant that we kept the editor easy to use at all times, allowing us to make levels really fast without impediments almost through the entire development process. Uh, so yeah, here's what the level editor, el editor looks like in Bez vs. Art. Uh, you kind of paint tiles onto the world little paintbrush tool and then you can uh, place spikes or paintings or trees on the outside of the levels. There's a selection tool which was pretty useful when we wanted to select something and rotate it because we were going from uh, landscape to portrait or something like that. Uh, and there's a play button up in the corner there and that play button as soon as you press play you can play the level. You're in the level playing it. Uh, so this was really like a cornerstone of what made this game work and what, what enabled us essentially to make so many good levels for this game. We needed good tools. Uh, so lesson four. Sorry, that's a, that's a PC uh, that uh, Yeah, so that was, that editor was PC. Yep, um, we do our development on PC and Mac, yeah. So lesson four. Create your level design palette. 
So now that you have a great level editor and you've play tested some of those levels so you kind of understand how people solve your problems, don't go in and try and create your masterpiece as the first step. You don't have all the information quite yet. Instead, your canvas should look something like that. You need to experiment with the colors that you have, uh, learn what makes them interesting and learn the interesting ways they combine, how they fit on a canvas before you can hope to create your masterpiece. So, what does that mean in practical terms? If I was creating a, a level with lasers in it, and lasers are one of our hazards in the game, I would go through and I would build out little sections of a level that had interesting things about lasers in them to me. They're not a full level, they're just something interesting about a laser, and I would save out a bunch of those. So the top one might be, what if we put a laser with little people in the level? How do they interact together? Oh, they interact in a really funny way. I'm gonna save that. Uh, the middle one might be how do lasers interact with this blocking door? Well, they get blocked by it. That's interesting, I'm gonna save that. And we do this again and again until you have like a really, really like a broad uh, spectrum of, of, or a broad knowledge, I guess, of, of what that entity does in your game, how, what, how it can be best used. And then once I have all the interesting pieces, I can begin to develop my masterpiece or my full level. And the pieces you'll find either directly slot into the level you're making, or they'll give me lots of different ideas and the resulting level will be more compelling. Like an artist, you have to mix and match all the colors first to find the most interesting combinations that are gonna create your best work. So lesson five, use visual direction and visual cues. So what do I, what do I mean by a visual cue? A visual cue is a term that's used in the psychology of perception and it's used to describe just something that captures our visual attention or, or draws our visual attention. So if we look at example A, we can clearly see that there is a difference or where the difference lies because our attention is drawn to that colored red X. However, if we look at example B, you might not have even noticed that there is an orange square. Here, because the pattern and color are competing for our visual attention, and the object we are searching for has only been changed in color, it's much harder to di differentiate the two. So the more elements a visual, visual cue at, has sorry, that differentiate it from its environment, the more powerful it will be. Um, obviously, the complexity of the surrounding environment does factor into play too. For example, the elements of a visual cue can be a change in movement, a change in color, a change in shape, a change in size. And this is really an extensive area of research, but if you have any questions, uh, ping me afterwards, I'll have a chat. And we can really see this in, in big games, right? Like, here's a shot of Diablo 3, I'm sure quite a few of you have, play, have played it. This is when a legendary item drops. These are items of extreme value, something that I really want. And the game makes sure that you don't miss that, because you don't want to miss that as a player. Um, and it's got this really big orange shaft of light going down to that, where that item is dropped on the ground. And obviously this is a pretty overt visual cue, um, but it's, it's overt because it's a really important item and it's a really complex environment. So when I say visual direction, slightly different. It's just, it's often using visual cues in a more subtle way to draw attention. So this is an example from Lawrence of Arabia. And this is called the Mirage shot. It's actually quite famous. And this shot aims to provide a dramatic entrance for Omar Sharif's Ali as he appears on the horizon out of a heat haze and towards the two main characters in the foreground. But they ran into some problems when they were filming this. No one was looking at the right place on the horizon where he appeared. Everyone was missing that really important dramatic entrance as he rides out of this heat haze. So product, production designer John Box essentially had a white line painted in the sand to the point on the horizon, and he had it uh, marked with black pebbles on either side to further frame it. And you can see that really obviously, right, when you look at this shot. So here they were using visual cues to direct attention in a, in a more subtle way. It's, it's really obvious when you see it and someone points it out, but when you're watching this movie, you just, your na eyes naturally shift to the right point on the horizon to see that dramatic entrance. So this can be used in level design too, and to great effect, and definitely is all across the industry. So here's a level in Bears vs. Art. And 
there's multiple moves that you can make from the bear's starting position in this level. Uh, as you can see, I can, I can go many different directions, but you might have already seen there's one direction that maybe we're trying to pull your eye to. And we've done this with more elaborate floor tiles in that direction. Uh, and we've also done it with adding more elements outside the level, such as the trees, the plants, and the bushes, uh, on that upper right-hand corner, or the right-hand side of the level. And this serves just to make that, that side of the level just a little bit heavier to the eye. You're more likely to just wander your gaze over there. Um, and once your gaze is there, you're probably going to make the, that move in that direction. So visual direction can really be a powerful tool to give in, for, for giving the player information uh, in a level by drawing their attention to different things you want them. And you see this a lot with lighting as well. Lighting's a really good one in uh, AAA. So lesson six, perceived difficulty versus actual difficulty. This is an interesting one. So I've got two levels up here from our game. And they probably look like they'd be fairly difficult when you first get into them. Uh, the first one there on the left has like two lasers right next to the bear and they're, they look pretty and they look pretty lasery. Um, and the one on the right has a lot of spikes. It has a lot of them, right? It, it's visually busy and it's, it's already like a lot of those floor tiles in that level are covered by spikes. How could that not be dangerous? But the actual difficulty at the top, they're both one out of 10. These are some of our easiest levels in the game. And it's interesting because when, a di when his level's difficulty is perceived higher than what it really is, players can really feel a heightened sense of achievement for completing it. So we didn't want these levels that are actually kind of more teaching or introduction levels. We didn't want these to feel like, feel like a pushover, but we actually did want them to be kind of a pushover because we didn't want people to fail on these introduction levels. And in order to do that, we made them look a bit more dangerous than they actually are. So people actually feel like they've solved a, a bit of a harder puzzle than they might have. And this is really useful. You can definitely go too far though, it's worth noting. Uh, a level can look t way too difficult to start off with and just overwhelm a player and they'll leave and, and not come back. So don't do that, but it can definitely like in moderation uh, be really useful as a, uh, something to use. But we discovered something further about how players perceive difficulty in Bears versus Art. So here's another two levels. So the one on the left, uh, it kind of looks simple when you look at it. You got the bear, and there's two buttons, a door, and three paintings. Um, that's it. It's a fairly small level too. And when you look at the one on the right, I've got like two doors, two buttons, four lasers. Yes, four lasers. Um, and they're all intersecting around a really big level. Like that level probably looks pretty complex. I think it looks complex. But the interesting thing here that we saw is that uh, sorry, and I should mention, like, these, these two levels are actually both 8 out of 10s, which you probably already <laughs> saw. Uh, so they're both the same difficulty, but one looks way easier than the other. And it's really interesting. Like, we saw people when they failed on the simple one. It was... It could actually leave them feeling inadequate. So, like, if there's something, like, if there's something wrong with them that they're not figuring out this puzzle, because it should be simple. It looks simple, right? They feel like they're not intelligent enough because it's clearly an easy level that other people must be solving easily. I'm just not getting it. Um, so perceived difficulty uh, doesn't really work the same both ways necessarily, and you've got to be careful of that. Uh, yeah, question? Those numbers that you've got up top right, are they actually on the screen or is that just your numbers that you've put in afterwards? <laughs> no, that's my numbers I put in afterwards. Um, I, uh, uh, we essentially like have a graph of all our levels and pass to, to fail ratio on all of them. It's kind of how we gauge general difficulty. Obviously, it's not perfect, but it, uh, it gives us an idea that these levels like, have a, the same amount of fails to, pa to passes on them. Um, yeah. So yeah, definitely, definitely be wary. Like, perceived difficulty can be a really neat trick to use uh, when you're making something simple seem more complex so that someone feels more rewarded for solving it. But if you make something really simple, really hard, it can almost have the opposite intended effect. Someone can think that that level is supposed to be easy, which is dangerous. Lesson seven, have the computer solve it. As part of developing a move limited game, we, we, we decided to develop an auto solver for our levels. Planning the optimal set of moves to solve out a level was becoming increasingly difficult as the levels became bigger and we had more of them and they were getting more complex. 
So we decided us designers just wanted to go sit on a beach and drink margaritas. So we got the coder that did the level editor to make this. Uh, so I'm totally ruining the level you just saw with those four lasers. So if you uh, haven't played the game, you can come back to this talk if you can't figure it out. Um, this is showing us, and it's bouncing around, showing us essentially the optimal moveset. And this is a piece of technical wizardry by our programmer. So good job, Adam Wood. Uh, and here you can see that it's solving that 8 out of 10 puzzle from before. And it visualizes that optimal set of moves, as I said. And it's pretty amazing. Essentially, it's an AI that will eventually beat us designers at our own game. But more than that, it's, it gave us a bunch of really useful information as designers when we were designing levels. For example, we can instantly see a heat map of where the most of the, level, uh, the moves are in a level. Right? You can kind of see that most of the moves are on the top of this level. That's interesting. It gives us information we could use to do something with visual direction in the top of that level. The also, AutoServer will also tell us like how many ways a level can be solved in that optimal amount of moves. So you can see on the side there, I've included uh, that this level can only be solved one way. If you look at the total minimum solutions, there's only one of them. However, it could be, if it could be solved 10 different ways uh, in the same number of moves, uh, we would see this and we'd be able to cycle through all those possible solutions. And of course, if you could solve this 10 ways in the same amount of moves, this level would be easier. But we wouldn't have known that unless we had the auto solver. Because the designers would have found an optimal move set and tried to find the optimal move set again and tried to find it again and gone, OK, I guess you can do this in the optimal moves of this. And this, le this level is exactly the same. You can do it in the optimal moves of, of the same number. But they might vary wildly in how many ways you can solve them in those moves. And that's really in interesting information. So the auto solver also had some unintended added benefits. Uh, question? Sorry? So we found when we were making levels without the auto solver, we would kind of approach it differently each time we did it. And we definitely occasionally drew out kind of, I, don't, I wouldn't say we drew out a path right to begin with, but we might make a level structure and draw out a path that we think is interesting and then place paintings on that to make it, make it a reality. But you actually find when you're working in this game that you, if you do that, often there's actually a better way to solve it than you thought there was. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. So since with the auto solver we were like finally combing through that level system to create it, we, we found bugs that only a computer would find. Uh, it would make moves that we thought were impossible given our current designs. Basically you could say it schooled us on our own game in a, in a certain way. And so the auto solver was a huge success and helped us create much better levels going forward. Um, it wasn't just a tool to solve levels. Lesson eight. So tricks leave a lasting impression. So we had many levels in our game with a long series of complex moves. And they were kind of required determination to complete. And in these levels, you kind of often repeated the same series of moves or the same type of challenge. The player was asked, what move are you going to make next over and over again? Although these provided like really active challenges, they, we found that they kind of lacked something that made that level special and unique. They didn't leave a lasting impression on players, which you totally want to do. On the flip side, we saw that levels requiring the player to figure out a trick became some of our most loved. A trick is like a novel or counterintuitive solution to, uh, that the player needs to decipher. Uh, and it can often be, like, seem impossible at first. And solving the puzzle in this way makes the player feel really smart. And they experience an aha moment when they get it. And the level becomes really easily solvable after that. There is no challenge after that. Like a twisted nail puzzle, which I'm sure a lot of you have, have tried to do, like the trick, they provide a really satisfying mental reward when you solve them. But they can require a really significant chunk of your time. So. The interesting thing about this is when you're looking at a playtest to play a level with a trick in it, it can often look like the enjoyment of that level decreases because they're trying to figure out the trick and they'll often fail way more than you expect doing that. And you're like, they're going to hate this game. They're just failing repeatedly at trying to do something. But the resulting aha moment that they get when they, when they solve that puzzle is really powerful. 
uh, and has a really, really big sense of achievement. And it kind of energetically up uplifts that player and is, is, is really good. Um, so Tricks definitely left uh, those lasting impressions on our players more than any other type of level did. So just to give you a quick example of what I'm talking about. So the level on the left is a level that I would say doesn't really have a trick. There is paintings on pillars in the middle of that level, a bunch of them, and you just have to figure out the moves to get them. That's, that's the, the whole level. Um, and while it can be satisfying figuring that out, it can be much more satisfying to figure out the other level, which is on the right here, which has this button and door. And there's just a simple trick of when you need to press that one button to pop up that door, and that's the level. Once you figured it out, you feel smart, you figured out the right way of doing that, and uh, you solve the level, and you feel awesome. Uh, lesson nine. Determine your extremes. So at some point, we had to ask ourselves with this game, how difficult is too difficult? Is there a limit to how challenging we can make a puzzle uh, in this game? And the answer was, we didn't know. So we decided to make some extra hard levels, and this was super fun because we were just trying to find what the maximum difficulty was. You can easily go overboard with this, but um, it was really fun. So this is what we came up with. Uh, it's a level named Master Plan. This level is still grounded in reason, though. It could be solved through logic given enough time. We didn't want to create an unsolvable level. We just wanted to see what the 10 out of 10 would be. The auto solver solved this in 30 moves. Um, and I can still count the amount of people that have completed this level in 30 moves on one hand. Level 75? No, this is, this is level 115. Um, level 75 is actually the one I just showed you with the auto solver running, so I've ruined that for everyone. So basically what we had created here was our Everest, right? We had began to ask ourselves, and then we began to ask ourselves, should we make the player ever climb this? We decided that the answer was a matter of when, not if. So we put this level into the game, though not with that move limit that the auto solver got, um, but that's still an achievement in the game, and that's why I know I can count it on one hand, the amount of people that have, that have got it. So this level was our Everest, and we had to make the seven summits that, that would train the player in the necessary skills to complete it. Uh, yep, question? Sorry. Did you ever like, decide on a maximum number of moves that a player could? Yeah, so out of this extreme that we determined, we, we kind of set a limit of 30. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, and we essentially make the auto solver discard levels that have over 30 moves. It just goes not too bad. It's not a level for this game. So to give you an idea, the seven summits are the highest mountains of each continent, and they're often used as, a tra as training for any climber that wants to get to climb Everest. And by making our extreme, it really helped us rank all our other levels of difficulty more accurately than we had ever before, bringing an overall better balance to the game, a smoother balance. So determining your extreme can really help your design uh, when, when balancing levels, I think, and uh, we just happened to make an extreme that we could build up to over time when the player had the necessary kind of skills in our game. So lesson 10, add breather levels or moments. So you need to lower the intensity and give the player a break at times. Uh, it's, it's about breaking the stare of the game um, where all eyes are on the player's skills. And it's constantly like, how are you performing? The player needs time to exert full control over their abilities without being challenged in order to feel powerful. Uh, if you're constantly just skirting the line, you don't have an opportunity to feel powerful. So this meant for us that the level right after that extreme that I just showed you, master plan, uh, is called bottled up and it's impossible to fail. This immediately gives the player a chance uh, at a quick win after they've had a really hard slog at that Everest level. And what's really interesting about Bottled Up, you kind of like move the bear and he gets knocked around all the arrows and he goes up there and removes all the guests. Uh, that there's no way to fail. Even though there's a set of spikes there, you actually can't hit them. Uh, 
And what's interesting is this level became some players' most, like their favorite level in the entire game, which kind of blew my mind. But it just, it shows the power of using breather levels really carefully and at the right times because people just get like an amazing release when they're like, oh my God, I just solved a puzzle after that last one that took me, you know, five days to solve or something. Um, so yeah. And of course, this kind of all comes under the branches of pacing, which is a huge area that I can't go into fully now, but it's basically just how you pace the challenges along uh, over the course of your game. Um, you've probably heard of it before. And Jesse Schell in the uh, Art of Game Design, a book of lenses, which is an awesome book, you should read it, uh, provides an illustration of what a good interest curve looks like, which is up the top. Um, kind of grows in intensity, but it gives you breaks, right? And really what this meant to us is uh, moving the spikes in difficulty in our game away from one another and making sure that players got a really proper breather after each of them and after a particularly hard challenge. So this is actually a subset of our levels down the bottom. Um, all you really need to know about that is the higher the bar is, the more difficult the level. And you can see pretty much consistently after all of our really spiky high, high difficulty levels at different points in the game, we either, we either make it impossible to fail or, you know, you only have to fail once before you figure it out. Um, just, a, just a breather from that difficulty. So when designing levels, you really need to be re uh, careful of where they fit in the context of your whole game. So I'm gonna leave this with a quote by Mike Stout, who's a uh, games designer who worked at Irrational, and I really hope he doesn't mind me using a quote from his blog, but I think it's really cool. He says, if it's always turned up to 11, then 11 becomes the new five. So lesson 11, not everything at once. So like spices, your game mechanics can add flavor in the form of challenges to your level. And like cooking, spices don't need, you don't need to use all of them at once to make something delicious. You have to mix and match. If you use all of them at once, players are gonna be confused and overwhelmed, much like a diner's palette. Choosing only a few mechanics at a time, even if you have many at your disposal, will allow players to focus on what's there and really better process the design in your level or the challenge in your level. Um, for example, this is a level at one of our later islands. So it uses two of our possible 11 mechanics in one level. We don't put seven, we don't put 11, all of our 11 mechanics in one level, we put two. Uh, this is another one, we use four. And what we found was that four was kind of just about the limit that we could uh, put in before players became frustrated or missed critical elements of our design. And plus, you can make a level with plenty of challenge and complexity when only four, four, four elements. I'm not talking about challenge and complexity, um, or rather I'm probably talking more about challenge. And complexity is what happens if you add too much, right? You don't wanna go overboard with that. Um, interestingly, Master Plan, our Everest level, used uh, two of our mechanics in the one level to get our Everest, so yeah. Uh, and interestingly, according to some researchers, the human brain can hold four pieces of distinct information in our working memory at one time. So it kind of, kind of fits in with that nicely. Lesson 12, off screen, out of mind. So in early development, our levels uh, could get quite large and players were allowed to pan the screen and look around, uh, mainly in the prototype. And when we play tested levels like this one, what would happen is players quickly saw uh, the two paintings at the top of that level, and they'd go for them to try and slash them up with the bear. And then they'd wonder why they hadn't completed the level. And well, they hadn't completed the level because there's two paintings off screen down the bottom there that they hadn't seen. And players would consistently forget off screen objects if they hadn't, uh, even if they'd seen them before and they just weren't on screen at that particular time. Uh, obviously repeated playthroughs at the same level kind of slowly lessened this effect, but it caused a lot of failures early on. So for us, the kind of solution with our game was pretty simple. We just made all of our levels one screen in the entire game, and we kind of limited the size. Again, we didn't need a large level to make a complex or difficult level either, so it, it didn't really bother us. Um, but you have to kind of make sure that all of your elements of a puzzle, especially when someone is kind of looking at how to solve this, it, players need to be able to plan. They need to be able to look at all the different elements and kind of figure out how they're connected. So they need to kind of be able to see all of that. And this isn't just, 
in, in mobile design or something, like you see this in AAA, right? Like this is a image from Portal. Um, and as you can see, like pretty much the entire puzzle or the important elements of this puzzle I can see um, in kind of one area. And you can see this with Portal, they make really boxy rooms so that you don't get your sight, light of sight uh, obstructed in the really complex puzzles. You can even see up there there's a button that kind of leads, its line leads to the door, and it's behind a pane of glass. So even though there's a wall there that's blocking the player, they can see that object. They know it exists, it's in their mind when they're thinking about the puzzle constantly. I can throw in another example here too. This is the Talos principle, if any of you have played it. Um, and it does really something similar. You know, a lot of its areas are really boxy. You can see all the elements of the puzzle. It even has something similar to the glass in Portal. They have barriers that you can see through. So uh, you can kind of remember elements of the puzzles that you can't even get to. Lesson 13, logic and chance don't play nice. So I'm going to take you a little bit back in the development timeline now. And this is the original prototype before we did much experimenting to it. And the spikes were our first attempt at adding chance into the game. Um, we felt that adding some chance in would kind of help us offset any skill variances by giving less skilled players uh, a chance at luck, a chance at a lucky break. Um, but we didn't have that in before, the game was really logical. So essentially the spikes in this version, each time the player would move, they would pick a random position out of the ones that they could be up at and just pop up there. So you can't really plan it, they, they might uh, just pop up in your way and that was definitely something we saw uh, playtesters hate. Like they came in and they, we would ask them at the end of the playtesting, so which was your most loved and which was your most hated thing about the game? And spikes were in the most hated column almost all the time. So why? So I'm going to delve a little bit into psychology here. Um, it's kind of natural for me, both my parents are psychologists. And I told them I'd never go into psychology as a career, and then I picked game design. Um, and game design is a lot of psychology. So if you're going into game design and you don't like psychology, too bad. In a classic paper published in 1979, titled Frustration, the Attribution of Blame and Aggression, which was citing research taken, undertaken at Harvard, uh, these two researchers, Kulik and Brown, reached some really interesting conclusions that helped us figure out what was wrong with our spikes. What have we done wrong when we're trying to add chance in? And the key learning from this research was that frustration and aggression increase in accordance with what they describe as the attribution of blame. Essentially, this is just where the blame lies when someone is obstructed from trying to attain a goal that they want. And they found that blame is most when the obstruction is deemed unjustified, when they didn't feel, feel they didn't deserve it. Blame was moderate when the, uh, when the action was deemed justified, when they felt they did deserve it. And it was actually least when the obstruction was self-caused, so they felt they had done something wrong. Uh, Obviously this produced high amounts of self-blame, but interestingly more blame is always associated to other people rather than oneself. And in addition there was a very pertinent finding that unexpected obstructions produced orders of magnitude more, more blame than regardless of whether they were unjustified, justified or self-caused. The unexpected, unexpected ones are the real kickers. So we went back and we redesigned the spikes in our full game uh, based on this knowledge that we, we kind of got uh, uh, researched. So this is, basically we had to deal with the frustration caused by them. That was, that was our takeaway. Uh, and the solution was just to reduce the unexpected failures caused by them. Um, and that was caused by chance. They would pop up randomly at a place you didn't want them to be and really cause you to be frustrated. You're, you're obstructed. And so we made the spikes logic driven. As you can see here, here in the final game, the spikes just toggle up and down as the bear moves. You can plan out the state of the spikes and the entire level. Um, they cease to be chance-based. And we validated this through further play testing, uh, in, which case, in which we saw the spikes actually like, drop off the most hated list entirely. And some players actually said they were their most loved. So that's a win. But to solve our issue, we just needed to go to the core of the problem. It's very hard to balance logic and chance in a puzzle game. And it's really easy to upset that balance Players can e easily experience something as uh, what, something random and chance-based as wrong or unfair. They're, they're really good at seeing through to the mechanical workings of your design. 
And unless you manage the frustration caused by implementing chance-based elements into your level, they're not going to pair well with any logic-driven ones you, you add. Lesson number 14. Add some humanizing elements to your levels. So we found that adding humans to our levels had some novel effects on player behavior and how they perceived and managed failure. So, yeah, so here is um, on the left, uh, we have our guests, which the bear can roll over. They're pretty cool, they run around the level. Um, and on the right, we have our security guard. And the security guard just kind of walks around until he either gets knocked out by the player by rolling into the back of him, or, he'll, or the player can get caught if, they, uh, yeah, if he catches them in his torch beam. And from adding these two to our levels, we had some really interesting observations. So the first I've called humanizing elements. And we found that theming these two mechanics as humans was really vital in our levels. It did some really interesting things. For example, we could have made guests floating orbs in our level that you had to collect. Essentially, the functionality would have been the same, whether they were little people you had to run over or orbs you had to collect. Um, but because they were human, players could give them personalities. And because they had personalities, it was much more natural to shift blame onto them, because blame is more attributed to other people, normally. Um, and we easily observed this in how players' behavior changed when they described failure, or their language changed, I should say, when describing failure. They would change it from the first person, I failed, to the third person, he managed to get away, she dodged me, the security guard turned around at the wrong time and caught me. And because of this, players were also less likely to get frustrated with the game or the developers to the point of giving up. So it was really interesting to us this and, and really was, was powerful in, in kind of the perception of our levels. The second one, uh, or second observation I should say we made from this was the power of rivalries. When we added the security guard to the level and because we had humanized him and the players could give him a personality, when they failed, they instead of being really, really frustrated, they just formed a rivalry, of this, rivalry with this character. And the rivalry became a big motivator to try again or, or replay levels, I guess. And, and rather than being discouraged by failing when they, when they got caught by a security guard, they would relish in the chance to have another attempt at that level to try and show the rival who's boss. And really adding a rival increased the appeal of our levels. In this way, adding humanized elements to the levels gave us really powerful tools to change be player behavior in a certain way. I know it's particularly not straight level design, but it was really interesting to us. So we're at lucky lesson 15. Get everyone involved. Routinely throughout the development of Bears vs. Art, we ran level design competitions, and this was open to any half brick employee, even the cleaner. And so enter these handsome folks. Uh, this is half brick minus their company photographer. And in the level design competition, we had a number of highly sought after mystery prizes that pe these people really wanted. We had sanitary hand wipes, a $2 tablecloth, an eyeglass repair kit, and the creme de la creme, a sew sewing booster pack containing three meters of elastic. Premium quality, I'm sure. So using our spectacular level editor that I talked about earlier, we encouraged people to submit levels to be reviewed. This got the whole company up and involved and excited. There was a buzz when these events happened. Uh, and as a result, there were many levels in our final game that came from these competitions. Um, and those that didn't make it into the final game that was submitted in these competitions served to spark ideas for numerous others. So when working on levels for a long time as a designer, Anything that breaks you out of your reg regular patterns that you think is the way you should be designing a level for this game is going to be extremely beneficial. What better way than to get everyone involved? Because a good idea can come from anywhere. Thanks. Yeah, so I don't know if you have any questions, you can ping them my way. Yep. Uh, so, when you, 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 
pop like the mechanic and then like you want to humanize the game. So are there any like patterns that you can use to try to figure out something that can work like a beer or a something else? Is there any patterns they use to, to uh, like any uh, design uh, principles or something like that? Uh -huh. For, for design and humanized elements, I mean, we we basically found that uh, like we, we we were kind of like figuring our way through this as we went along because we we tried initially to add chance into this game in in many different ways. We had the spikes that were were you know entirely random and popped up and down. Uh, we had random paintings that just kind of get cycled through and then the level starts. Um, and we kind of had different observations from these different types of chance. But we found that we could, for the most part, always humanize them. So we kind of, we found what worked and we kind of just went with it. Um, so for example, there's now in the full game, there's a ghost that like moves paintings around in the gallery. Um, he's pretty funny. Uh, and this is just because we saw that the, the uh, guests and the security guards like were some of our most, most loved elements and also uh, could produce hard levels that that kind of didn't make players frustrated when they failed repeatedly on them. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, a bit, but, uh, so how do you decide like, to use a bear instead of a fish or a fruit? All right. <laughs> um, I, like, we, we picked specifically humans. Um, so he's asking about the beer. Why did you choose the beer? The beer? beer. beer. Oh, the bear. OK, sorry. My bad. Um, so, uh, okay, so we, cho we chose the bear. <laughs> that, that's an interesting question. Um, we, we thought it was quirky, basically. Um, uh, the, the bear was, uh, a bear that dislikes art was just uh, amusing to us. Um, we just roll with amusing ideas at Half Break, really. Yeah. Yeah, from modern artists, they must, uh, not yeah I, I think like the bear just doesn't really understand modern art and that just angers him, so. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's really why we chose the bear. We thought that was an interesting motivation for a character. The one that we can identify with, some of us can. Yeah. Uh, yeah? So how did you test the later levels? If you're just getting people in from just walking in. Yep. Um, so we kind of did a bit of a different process when we were testing the later levels. Like we definitely focused on with our prototype testing, what we're doing on the prototype, we focused really uh, really on the early levels and obviously they are super important um, but we didn't want to neglect the later levels so kind of later on in development I guess probably about halfway through development when we had oh, I was probably about two-thirds of the way through actually when we had the full game up and running uh, we actually did a beta where we we got people into the office loaded the game onto their phone and let them let them go out to the wild and we gave them two weeks I think it was to play the game before it would uh, brick itself uh, so uh, that's kind of how we got some of the later level testing early on. Um, yeah, so we, we got quite a few people out. I think we we did over 50, I think. Yeah. Um, yep. Um, how did adding mechanics like uh, limiting the amount of attempts or adding in the upgrade uh, mechanic affect any of the puzzles? Okay, so uh, the upgrade mechanic for people who haven't, I'm assuming you've played the game. Um, for the, those of you who haven't played it, you can, uh, you can, it's kind of this RPG system we added, and you can add skill points to the bear that give him extra moves. Uh, and that was interesting to add in, and we, add, we added, it definitely affects the puzzles a lot. Uh, and we added, we added that in because we saw that essentially the difficulty at the end of the game was maybe a little bit more than we would have liked. Um, and we also wanted to have a little bit of more of a progression system in there. And so that kind of like checked two boxes for us. Like we could have gone to those levels and made them easier at the end of the game. That would have kind of defeated some of the purpose of adding our progression system in there. So that's why we, we added that in to kind of offset uh, the level difficulty with like just a few extra moves that you get through that upgrade system. What was the other part of your question? Uh, the limiting move attempts. Oh, I'm sorry, not the limiting move attempts. Oh, the energy, yeah. Uh, so. The energy is always like a contentious point um, whenever you bring it up, but we, we found, uh, we actually did a lot of split testing when we did soft launch on this game, and we found that the thing about energy, the thing about something that limits the amount of times you can play the game is uh, it, it, actually, it actually can uh, kind of increase how much someone's going to play your game. 
Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's not going to work for every game, and it's not going to function the same way for every game. You know, every game's different. But we definitely saw that giving people kind of bite-sized chunks of the game that they could kind of digest and, and play and then have to have, take a break and come back would make them play for longer than if they'd like just be able to play the whole thing and get kind of burnt out on it. And especially since the game is really highly logic-driven and a lot of the levels are quite similar. We found that people actually did get burnt out in our game quite a bit. Um, so, like, it, I think it you know varies depending on your goals and your game, but for for us, it it kind of worked out. Uh, sorry, can you explain that? Because um, I've only just played it a little bit. Can yeah. Energy. That means that you can play it for certain number. Yeah. Of so e energy is kind of just an industry term, but e energy is just uh, something that limits your your amount of play attempts in in one session. So. Uh, Yeah, so how many attempts in total at the level, regardless of whether you fail or pass. Yeah, um, and it kind of recharges over time. So if you use all of that um, energy, um, in our game it's pause. You have to wait for a little bit before you can come back to the game uh, and try it again. Uh, and it just limits the, uh, yeah, as I said, like a, it, it just limits the amount of uh, banging head against the wall sometimes, which can actually be really helpful. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, not really, um, is the answer. But I, I, I think like we, we definitely, uh, so we, we, we kind of have like sets of levels that build upon each other. Um, and, you know, in good level design fashion, they like introduce the simple version of the mechanic and then they, uh, you know, teach you how to use it in a more complex scenario. And then they eventually kind of merge that with other things we introduced prior. So you get kind of like interesting ways to use that. So we definitely kind of like bookend certain sections in that way. Um, yeah, but we didn't have like an overarching like underlying level for all of them or anything. Yeah. Yep. Um, this is probably a little bit off topic, but what actually inspired the idea to like have um, the costumes and have those upgrade as well to come um, with the um, extra, extra um, gen RPGs of that to it? Yeah, so we were kind of, so the, the costumes, you can buy costumes to the bear and just outfit him in cool stuff like a fez. Um, and uh, the costume system was in there from right the get-go. We knew we wanted to do that, um, and that's just because we've kind of done that at Half Brick in all our games, almost, except Fruit Ninja. Um, I guess the dojos and blades are kind of your costumes in Fruit Ninja. Uh, but, you know, Jetpack Joride, huge costume system. Um, Fish Out of Water, the game we worked on before we shot Bears vs. Art, we added costumes kind of after the fact to that, but we, we've just seen that, like, players love these. Like, that's why we add them. Um, and the reason we kind of hooked that into the skill system was just we kind of wanted, we, we liked Diablo and we wanted to uh, kind of have, have our, our little bit of Diablo-ness in Bears vs. Art, but uh, obviously there's only so far I can go with that. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk more about the monetization, like how that works in the rules and stuff? Yeah, so I mean, the, the monetization in BBA is, uh, and it's, <laughs> we, we try to be as, as uh, as forgiving as we could with it, um, but I mean, it, it definitely like it definitely affects the way you design levels. Um, it's you know, I'd, I'd be crazy to say it didn't. I mean, it's uh, it's something that you're thinking about with. I mean, this is a free-to-play game. Um, you know, we when you download it, you're not giving us money for making it uh, just right off the bat. You know, we we have to kind of. I, I hope we earn that from from the quality of the game that we create. But you know, definitely, like we, we see that monetization like definitely spikes a little bit on those difficult levels when people want to like pay to to like get a little bit of helping hand to get through it. Um, so for us, it's kind of a balance of, of making it so that um, you know we're going to earn some money out of the game, hopefully, and the people will pay for some of those spikes. We don't want to make them too hard for the people that don't want to pay, right? We we want to make them fair. Um, so it's 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 you're constantly thinking about how to straddle that line, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah, so in Bez vs. Art, um, we, you can buy some extra moves. Um, there are coin packs that you can use on costumes. Um, you can buy, pay to, to change the bear's color, like cosmetic stuff, um, mostly. But, you know, there, there definitely is an element of, like, you, you can pay if you want extra moves. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. You can talk to me afterwards if you need to. Cool, any other questions? Yeah. In terms of uh, not putting too many mechanics in Yep. Uh, for your games that you live with, four, I believe? Yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, we found that four was a good number. So, in the event that you have like, a cooperative puzzle game with more players, mm. can you increase the number of mechanics in 
at a given level? Probably. Like, I, I think, like, it, it, as long as, like, players, I guess, I guess for me, like, it's, it's about just the amount of information you can keep in your head at one time. Uh, and if you have two players, then more information can be kind of stored between them, I guess. Um, I, I don't know how that exactly works. Um, I've never actually made a, a co-op puzzle game, but uh, I, I would say that you definitely can. Like, you definitely see there are games that use more than that. Uh, but for us, we found that like if it's just one person focusing on that, as well as planning out moves in this game, like four was definitely kind of the limit of, of kind of complex interactions you can do. And I'm not just talking about small ones. I'm talking about like really big changes in the level, such as lasers going on and off and spikes going on, up and down and things like that. Um, I don't, don't know if that answers your question, but <laughs> yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Yep. <laughs> um, I, I would mostly be speculating. I, I honestly haven't played a lot of Bejeweled. Um, uh, I've definitely kind of played the more modern iterations of the match three concept, I guess. Um, but uh, I mean, like we we definitely play played those games and we looked at them. But um, we were also we also wanted to create something like novel and new and 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 something that was you know different from that space. So. Um, we took what we could, and then we made a game about a bear who dislikes art. Um, yeah. Like <laughs> yes. Well, it doesn't understand art, I think, probably. Cool. Yep. Yeah, um, so, uh, if they uh, finish all the levels, um, what will happen? Or have you ever think about uh, player can and their own level and share with other players? Yeah, so the, the question is, like, what happens when players finish the game, and, and can you add your own level? Did we think about adding, adding, adding the opportunity for players to make their own levels? We did. Um, we thought about it. Um, we even tried bits of that out, um, but eventually got put into a hard basket, but we did make something pretty cool that kind of answers your question. So we ended up making, in, in the current game, there's a mode called Infinite Mode, and we essentially designed a system that designs levels for us. And it's, it randomly generates levels, and it randomly generates them quite intelligently within a difficulty range, too, that the player can specify. So the player can say, I want a harder puzzle, I want an easier puzzle, or this is just right. And they can continue playing them. And it's separate from our main progression and things like that. So this kind of feeds into um, how we were, we were trying to be a little bit, bit nice, like when you're stuck on the main progression, um, there's a chance for you to go to an infinite mode and play some levels that are more your difficulty if it's getting too hard. Uh, and so, it, yeah, like, that's a really large topic, how we developed that, and it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Um, but, it, but essentially, like, I was going to put a point in this talk that was, you know, level design can be designing a system to design levels for you. There's a lot of level design that goes into designing a system that designs random levels, if that makes sense. Um, and we definitely had to be, as designers, really involved in that process to get the best possible level generator we could. So... Yes, once you finish the game, you can go play that mode, and uh, it's not user created, but it's it's you know it's it, it is unique levels to you, and you can share them with your friends and stuff, which is pretty cool too. Yep. Why didn't you connect those two modes together? Like when you finish the main game, you just transition to the. So, the yeah, I, <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, I think the main reason is we want to expand upon the main game and keep adding levels to that. Yeah. Uh, I don't have an accurate figure on hand for you, uh, but I can get you one. I'll give you my, give you my card. Uh, yeah, it, it's quite small, like any other free to play game. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, thanks guys for coming out. I don't. All right. Yep. Just regarding that ratio, what what ratio do you guys target? Obviously, 100 would be great. So I'm probably not at liberty to just really discuss any of those targets. To be oh, perfectly okay. honest, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, suffice to say, like we set them, like how we set them is, is based on what we see other companies um, releasing. Uh, and, and they also vary based on the type of game. Um, because uh, you, you can't expect uh, a certain type of free-to-play game such as 
uh, a builder like Clash of Clans or SimCity Build It, um, you expect them to monetize higher than a game like Candy Crush or Bejeweled. Um, mostly because Candy Crush works with the, the kind of influ large influx of players where Clash of Clans and SimCity Build It work because a small subset of people stay and really get invested into those games. Um, so we set the targets based off what, what this game or what the other game we're, we're measuring against, like wh how, wh where they best fit, in, fit into the market. So what are we looking at trying to hit, I guess? Are those figures for other companies commercially available somewhere? Um, yeah, if you do some searches online, they are available in certain circumstances. Um, obviously, it's really hard to tell what, com what different companies use to measure and like how they do that um, is, is they obviously they, they often release stats, but it's really hard to tell where they came from. So uh, that's also something to be cautious of, um, too. I don't know if that a little bit answers your question, but hopefully, hopefully it does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank, thanks for coming out, everyone, on Father's Day. Uh, happy Father's Day. Any fathers in here? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks everyone for coming and if 